Yeah. Um, right, so our first speaker this morning is our keynote. Um, I just saw them uh, from Arm or did raise a functional safety project product. Um, he leads the functional um, safety team on product management activities at Arm. He has about 17 years of experience in deploying safety in tier ones and safety buses. He has worked on various vehicle level segments, including powertrain, body control, ADAS, and cockpit instrument cluster construction. And so he's our first two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, everyone are able to hear me loud and clear. Uh, Mark, uh, Mike, uh, I think there's an echo there. Mike, I think there's an echo coming out from a speaker. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the speaker. Sure enough. Perfect. Yep, that works. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, hopefully, uh, you had some good uh, networking this morning. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the Verification Futures Conference 2023. Uh, I thank the organizers for uh, giving me a, a forum to outlay the vision for functional safety on, uh, on autonomous and zonal controllers. Uh, uh, a short introduction, uh, I'm Madhusudan Rao. Uh, I lead the functional safety product team in the automotive line of business within ARM. Uh, based out of Cambridge, uh, uh, and my key roles are to do with product management for automotive industrial uh, drive functional safety strategy requirements into our, our portfolio, and uh, and enabling our ecosystem to to build uh, safety products uh, using ARM technology. Yep. So uh, today. Uh, 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 I'll give you a high level overview of what ARM is with respect to automotive, and then we can and see how, how this all plays out. Uh, ARM has been with, uh, uh, with the automotive for nearly 25 years. Uh, it, it seems uh, uh, shocking. So probably our first products uh, in the automotive segment was in way back in 1998, wherein we started to provide our M and R class set of products into the automotive segment back then. And, and today we are uh, uh, a top 15 IP semiconductor supplier in the automotive domain. We are market leaders with respect to application processors uh, for ADAS and IBI. So, uh, and, and from, uh, we, <clears throat> so we work with, uh, we have 20, more than 25 processors, uh, uh, more than 25 ARM-based processors would be on, on vehicles starting 2025, that's our estimate, and nearly more than 25, more than 50 ARM-based processors are deployed on, onto vehicle every second. So that's, uh, that's the uh, range and uh, the depth of our engagement within the automotive segment. From an uh, engagement perspective, uh, ARM works with uh, the, the OEMs, the tier ones, the silicon manufacturers, software companies, and other key ecosystem partners in the automotive segment to deploy a, a world-class range of uh, automotive products and solutions. Today, uh, I just want to talk about three mega trends that are out in, in outplay in, in our segment from an automotive perspective. The three big mega trends that are there in, in the automotive is automation, user experience, and electrification. The electrification is is all underneath the car, and and uh, uh, and 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 it's happening as you see it. You see more electrific electrification uh, uh, train that's happening within the uh, within the automotive segment. The in the entire power train is being changed uh, from from a uh, from a traditional ice based thing, uh, power train system to to a new age electrification. That's one of the key trend and a mega trend that's there. Which is outplaying in the market. The second biggest automation could be uh, an ADAS segment, could be an autonomous driving segment uh, called AD, 
and and there are various tune, uh, uh, various layers of of uh, this trend being uh, played out in the industry. The third is user experience. This is where the human machine interface uh, comes to play. So your cockpit, your IVI, they're all being uh, changed every uh, at, at a very fast pace. So these are the big three segments that we are looking at uh, to deploy automotive. And, and if you see why these three big segments, these are the biggest uh, segments with respect to growth. So the ADAS uh, cockpit and uh, and the electrification plays a very good from a from a growth perspective. So the whole market and the segment is growing enormously with uh, high levels of CAGR, and that's that's one of the key trends uh, wherein we were, where our products are deployed to cater to those segments. The second biggest mega uh, trend that's happening within the industry is a supply chain trend. In in this segment, uh, basically. Uh, the the entire supply chain is uh, in the automotive was was highly hierarchical from from an IP supplier to a to a sock vendor to a tier one supplier uh, and then an OEM so there's layered structured of of how a particular product gets developed today that is completely broken up so there's a new way of how the whole supply chain is reorganizing itself and and redeploying and 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 uh, there are no clear-cut boundaries by which these uh, supply chains are working and uh, today arm is engaging with oems tier ones and various other supply chains basically to to understand what the new play is. so the the oems would like to have a greater say in how our products being gets developed deployed and uh, and and meet their specific uh, goals and objectives that they are deploying on the product and hence uh, that's another key trend that's that's moving up. The third biggest trend from a from a whole market segment perspective is uh, is is on software and 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 various other systems. Uh, from from a software perspective, what's uh, the underlying thing that's changing is something called application consolidation. So we'll come to this topic uh, later. What what that means is, and 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 back then it was more hardware defined. Uh, or or tier one defined functionalities that were there, and and we are moving into a segment called software defined functionality, wherein uh, the the underlying strategy for deploying a vehicle is is going to be software first, and then uh, we work out the software strategy of how the shelf life of the software could be uh, could be elongated and redeployable, and how how are you going to have a firmware over the air updates and so on. So, and, and how do you provide a continuous feature update to a consumer? So that's what is driving OEMs, and, and that is, is a key def definition. And, and that plays, uh, that has an underlying theme of how we develop our hardware and software and our, our products within the market. Uh, the third biggest segment is something called high performance compute. So, so there's absolutely blurring uh, definition which is happening between personal compute and the compute that's happening on, on vehicles today. So uh, uh, the user expectation today is to have uh, very high levels of compute, uh, even on on vehicles, to get the same level of user experience and so on. And and the and and the other three big players that are that are the trends from a from the software perspective are energy efficiency, having functional safety and secure security on on those products. So what does uh, it lead to? So the three mega trends uh, of of changing vehicle architecture, supply chain supply chain being altered, and and software complexity being merged into into various other uh, in, into a, uh, into a application consolidation strategy. What does it all lead to? It leads to something called the software defined vehicle, uh, wherein uh, the overall vehicle cloud user application. Uh, is is going to be uh, quite uh, uh, is going to be different. It's going to be cloud native approach. That's that's the end goal target, wherein the features and and functions uh, would not only be deployed on vehicle, but it would be uh, it could be deployed on real time, uh, and it could be tested. It could be uh, validated uh, on a cloud and then deployed on a vehicle 
as we uh, as we move along and 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 this leads to uh, a lot of other use cases and applications and and a lot of derivatives associated with it there are other key trend trends with respect to the technology and architecture related which 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 have an influence in our in the market segment that we work with so on the left uh, to your left it would be the a traditional architecture this is how a traditional OEM's vehicle architecture looks like in today's car. So there are multiple ECUs in a car uh, and they are all uh, called uh, distributed based on functionality. So if you have a body control with a seat control unit or a, or a seat heating unit, they all come with a box performing a specific function and a specific set of hardware uh, associated with it and a specific set of sensors and an actuator associated with it. So this is how a traditional uh, ECU deployment in a, in a traditional system and, and most of the cars today on, on road are following this traditional approach. The trend uh, started to move into something called domain controllers with, uh, with mainly with cockpit and ADAS systems. So when ADAS came into the play, uh, they, uh, the, the OEM started to create a consolidated view of how should we create different, for each of the different functionalities in the vehicle, should we have a different ECU and, and a functionality to it? Like for a front camera, should it have a separate box? The radar, should it have a separate ECU? Or could we consolidate things? And that's when uh, the ADAS AD domain controller came into existence. So there are a few vehicles today which has a common ADAS system performing level two and level three functionalities and, and so on. And then, uh, and then the other big, play was also on on digital cockpit wherein uh, we would like we, we wanted to have a, a common uh, set of uh, functionality to drive both our IBI system and instrument cluster as a key display related systems so that was the uh, intermediate step and and we are seeing that trend uh, uh, being executed right now but the future is going to be a centralized architecture it's going to be a centralized compute wherein you would have very high performance compute strategy on, on a vehicle, and then you would have zonal gateways at various sections of the vehicle. And what, it, what does it mean? It means that you need pretty high levels of compute, pretty high levels of safety, pretty high levels of the levels of security that's deployed on a, on a centralized architecture. All the functionalities of the vehicle would be executed on a, is, is theoretically, uh, they would like to execute it on a, on a common, segment or a common box and and uh, and the zonals act as an abstraction layer to abstract the devices with sensors and actuators associated with it so that's that's the overall key trend from a zonal architecture perspective so how does it look in a car so the domain uh, uh, segments uh, the domain and zonal controllers would work in in, in va various uh, uh, range of functions so you would see on the left uh, a domain controller being there for uh, uh, an ADAS and a cockpit system, which is there, with, which is in green, and then uh, with with few distributed controlling mechanisms uh, to to drive segments of gateway, body, and and vehicle dynamics. Uh, the road ahead, as we discussed, is centralized compute with zone controller, where you have specific zone-related controlling and then they would control for a specific area where the functionality is deployed. This strategy would also reduce the amount of copper intake within the vehicle. So the, the, the amount of wiring that happens and the wiring hardness which is there inside your vehicle is, is enormous. And that adds a lot of weight and inefficiency into the vehicle. So what is happening is now you would have just an ethernet cable that just runs across these segments with one power line which can actually uh, reduce a lot of uh, weight within the car and bring in efficient, efficient driving dynamics into the vehicle as well. So this is this is a key trend that that's uh, driving the vehicle. The second biggest trend, the first one was zonals and architecture. The second biggest is the ADAS and autonomous. So in this segment, uh, as you all know, there are five levels of uh, SAE defined five levels of autonomous driving. That's uh, that's the industry is playing out. Uh, today we we have a few vehicles which are level three autonomous condition deployed, which are you can do a hands off kind of a scenario, and and they've been deployed in specific uh, highways and and segments. We are moving into a world of level four, where a highway pilot 
uh, or traffic jam assist and other functions get uh, uh, even more uh, automated on specific ODD conditions and, uh, and they are able to deploy them uh, on road uh, within the next few years. And, and then uh, the journey towards LL5 continues and, and that's, that's uh, probably the, the holy grail from the automo autonomous industry perspective. But the key trends that are playing in this segment are a, a massive in, increase in, in the number of sensors on the vehicle, uh, system consolidation, uh, they would like to reduce the cost by reducing the number of uh, uh, sensors, or I mean, the number of uh, boxes that control the overall vehicle, power consumption, thermal constraints, uh, complex algorithms, and as well as safety. So there's, there's a segment called number of ACIL beta and, and delta software solutions that are increasing. So we'll come to those terminologies uh, in right in a moment, but these are the key trends uh, that, that play out into the ADA as an autonomous segment. Uh, there was a, there was a uh, key uh, commissioning of, of, of a key uh, report wherein how the challenges of autonomous deployment is gonna look like. And, 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 and the key trend there is the autonomous driving uh, segment is not gonna be a light switch moment wherein you're gonna have all the key functionalities of autonomous driving right deployed after a vehicle is released. Or for example, uh, uh, a particular feature gets deployed right from day one. Uh, so it's gonna be, a, a, it's gonna be an industry wide segment wherein it's gonna be more le uh, linear in approach and, and, and a continuous improvement basis. The strategy would be to have the hardware deployed on the vehicle and then work on the software on a continuous basis and enable the feature. So that's, that's, a, that's a playbook that's already in play in today's market segment, and, and that would continue. Um, the third big segment from a technology perspective within the vehicle is cockpit. So the key things which come inside the vehicle cockpit are digital clusters, your mirrors are getting replaced with e-mirrors, surround view, uh, driver assistance, augmented reality, uh, head-up displays, and, and, and cabin monitoring, and so on. So these are the key segments where the vehicle is actually, the in-vehicle experience is being continuously changed. And, and that brings in a lot of safety and security requirements with respect to our cockpit uh, strategy as well, right? So the key trends, again, from a cockpit is to have a, a more complex safety content, number of displays are gonna enlarge to, uh, to a larger screens, more, more content on the screen. Uh, there's again an application consolidation strategy that's being played out there. And uh, there's gonna be an increased safety and security approach that, that needs to be deployed on, 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 on cockpits. So uh, with all these things, how do we deliver a common safety platform? We need to have one particular safety strategy which can address three market trends that are being addressed, three technological trends that are under play. But when we develop a particular hardware, software, or a solution associated with it, how does it play out? Uh, and, and how do we deliver our, uh, how do we de de deliver a, a product which could meet the increased complexity of software uh, in, in a software-defined vehicle world? So that's, that's a key challenge. So hold on to this challenge and then we'll come back how we play this out. Uh, just a short uh, anecdote of, of uh, to, to basically uh, bring people onto what is functional safety. So because we're gonna go a bit deep into what functional safety is. So I just wanna bring in, uh, uh, bring the audience into this segment to say uh, what it means uh, for every one of us uh, and, 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 and not everyone would be from the automotive segment as well here, yeah, right? So uh, from, from a standard perspective, uh, you would see a number playing out there called 26262. So this is one of the automotive functional safety standards that we look at. And, 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 and this definition from, from the standard is absence of unreasonable risks, hazards caused by malfunctions of, uh, of EE systems. So the EE is uh, the electrical electronic systems, which could be your hardware, your software, your, your PLCs, everything uh, that's, uh, that's related to your, uh, the, which defines into that EE segment. Uh, to perform, for, for any functionality to, to work uh, correctly, 
uh, from a safety perspective, we basically look at two broad definitions, whether it's systematically developed and whether it addresses a diagnostic capability. So uh, these two capabilities are, are the underlying theme of any functional safety discussion. So how well the design of the, of, of the product is done. If the design is great, uh, if the testing and the validation and the verification to that product, and it's been developed with top-notch uh, safety considerations in mind, then we say that the product is like systematically developed. There are key considerations to say that you have a top-level requirements and, and you need to make sure that uh, they meet the safety requirements uh, with, with right safety analysis and so on and so forth. But the on, on a, if I have to abstract it, it, it just means that uh, we we have to deploy it with with the right level of uh, rigor on on system de uh, system development. Uh, the second one is diagnostic. It's mainly applicable on the hardware segments. So every hardware has a has a possibility to fail with with either due to uh, due, it's called a fit rate, basically due to uh, uh, a, a failure in time due to uh, uh, aging factors, EMI factors, external factors. So various other factors could have an influence in, in, in execution of your hardware segment. And uh, basically uh, every hardware has a particular set of diagnostic capability that needs to uh, be addressed. From, from a standards perspective, uh, there are various industry standards that are available in, uh, today. Uh, if, 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 we, if our product, uh, if a hardware product or a software product has to be deployed into automotive, then it's, uh, and if it has a safety requirement associated with it, then we need to work with uh, a key standard associated with 26262. But then uh, if it's gonna be on industrial robotics and so on, then there are various other set, uh, standards like 61508 and, and so on. And, and they have some specific objectives to say that uh, from a diagnostic capability, they, they have to hit a particular set of SPFM coverage, which means a single point fault coverage needs to be at certain level of 90% for an ACL beta, ACL C, S, ACL delta. So uh, to the uninformed on, on ACLs, it's the automotive safety integrity level. So this is the risk classification in an automotive segment the higher the risk, the higher the va value in the number there. So it's, if an ACLD is there, it's, it's a high risk system and you need to have a higher coverage and uh, with respect to a single point fault and you need to perform, and your hardware should be of, uh, of uh, your hardware should be designed or your product should be designed, whatever it is, to meet that capability. Uh, so uh, the standards always have a lag sometimes with the industry outcomes. So the industry would, would be basically going ahead with deploying ADAS and AD features, but the standards sometimes have to catch up. And, and I think that's, that's where we are with respect to some of these segments. From, from an ARM perspective, uh, uh, the strategies have, uh, is, is, is three, is, is, could be bucketed into three different broad categories. And our strategy is called safety ready, wherein we take our uh, IPs, have all the innovative safety features deployed onto that IP right from the beginning. And uh, that's to make sure that the product meets the technological changes. So we had three technological trends and to meet those technological trends, our IPs are developed to meet specific features with our, which our safety capable are added onto those IPs to make sure that we, we hit that uh, strategy. The second is certified software components and software tools which is the, the hardware alone cannot play uh, a complete safety system. So you need to have the underlying uh, software <laughs> ecosystem, the, uh, the drivers, the, the underlying uh, 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 test uh, strategies, uh, compilers and so on, all have to be at, at the same safety rigor that the hardware gets deployed and the IP gets deployed in. So we need to work with uh, various partners within the organization, outside the organization, so that they all converge into that overall strategy. The third is to ensure a robust methodology and, 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 and a certification strategy. So all our products get certified from an external assessment perspective to make sure that they are, those products are, are safety ready to be deployed on a vehicle or an industrial robotic segment. Well, th this is key because this strategy is very key because from there's an underlying trend within the automotive uh, industry to have uh, 
uh, a faster time to market and and what our products would do with these strategies we are going to have a shift left so we are going to accelerate the time to market by deploying the key features right from the bottom of the hardware segments so that they can use these products with uh, with uh, with key confidence on, on on a safety segment on, on a safety application uh, so our portfolio basically uh, which includes the CPUs, GPUs, and ISPs, uh, and 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 beyond, are all basically developed on a on a common platform from a safety perspective, common safety definitions within the organization, key features deployed across the products. It's not going to be one single product that is going to have this feature and the other not, because all these features come into play in unison together to deploy one particular functionality for a vehicle. For example, uh, if you're looking at a front camera of a, of a car today, it's going to have the ISP uh, and it's going to have a CPU and, and a GPU to, to monitor, uh, to do image processing, to do workload balancing, and as well as overall application processing associated with it. From a, from a top level vehicle perspective, all three systems and IPs are developing one single function. And, and hence, your safety capability cannot be uh, uh, different for each of the products when, uh, deployed in the entire chain. So what we basically do is uh, have a common theme to address these segments. The biggest, the second biggest thing is the whole problem of safety could not be solved by just one player there. So Arm as a company, we, we work with uh, our SIP partners, the operating system, uh, as software vending companies and, and the tool deployment companies and application processors and then we work with the entire supply chain of tier one and OEMs to deploy our products, right? But when we develop a safety product, the entire chain here needs to have a, a, a good uh, validation of, a, uh, of the product uh, and, and a good confidence that the product has been de deployed or developed based on uh, uh, key safety standards. So hence, uh, our strategy has been to deploy the, the certification strategy that we looked at that all our products both hardware and software would be an independently assessed would actually play into this game to say that when we give a, an independent or a certified product from an external uh, company the entire supply chain would actually uh, they all work with the same supply partners and and independent assessors and and they are all uh, buying into that overall uh, confidence level and within the organization to deploy the functional safety systematic fault avoidance we need to ensure that a, a range of things gets deployed within the organization so it, it just means the overall functional safety management system within the organization involves every department with this uh, which is it could be quality it could be a design verification team the assessment teams uh, quality assurance, our errata management strategy, support maintenance. So the functional safety per se from a, from a systematic deployment addresses the entire organization. So the entire organization needs to pivot to basically deliver a, a safe product into the market. That is one of the key criteria. So the systematic capabilities addressed through uh, key deployments within the organization. So how would we develop the hardware the underlying hardware to develop, to put it onto the market for uh, for applications for autonomous and so on, right? So, so we looked at four different SIL levels or ACIL levels called ACIL A, B, C, and D. The uh, the the strategy until now has been that, uh, from a hardware perspective, uh, the 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 processors are normally put in core pairs and uh, they are locked a uh, uh, dual core lockstep strategy is being used to put two cores to work in unison and and one is as a checker core and, and as a main core to basically execute uh, workloads which are of ASL uh, which are safety compliant and normally are in split configurations when they are uh, for performance oriented applications uh, and and when it when they are actually in in in, in lock mode, the the uh, it increases it it reduces software complexity on on the, on the overhead 
basically because every check of the diagnostic failure that's there un un under underlying, uh, I mean, underneath the hardware is is being deployed uh, or is checked, but uh, but it brings a key gap wherein the availability of the system is is going to be reduced because you have four cores, and if you deploy it, for example, if your if your configuration of your CPU has four cores in it and and you deploy two cores just for checking and just for and, and just two cores are running normal application workloads then you're actually reducing the availability of the system so uh, and, and 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 in today's automotive world there are key workloads which are of ACLD where a, a lock is is something which is essential to do uh, but then increasingly there are many other workloads within the automotive segment which are of ACL beta B and and for those where vehicle vehicular functionalities and so on we don't need uh, all the time probably to to a lock uh, mode and there are other alternatives that uh, are present to deploy those workloads and and that's what we are looking at so uh, there are three segments uh, oops sorry the three segments here uh, one is called uh, a split mode for ACLB, which was uh, the prior strategy. So you can use a split mode to do an ACLB workload. The key point being that uh, the integrator of our IPs have to perform something called an L-BIST strategy, which is called a logic BIST, where in every few, uh, uh, at every few timing intervals, you would bring down the core, execute the hardware functionalities if there is an error in the hardware, and bring back the core all over again. Basically, what you're doing is uh, a massive reduction in the uh, uh, in the course availability to perform application processing, uh, basically to do a, a random hardware failure check. Uh, on the right side, you have a lock mode wherein you're doing continuous checking uh, that you don't bring down cores, you don't bring it up there. And since they are completely in lock mode, they do a continuous monitoring of the, of, of the course. But uh, if you look at the availability perspective, you just have two cores which are in blue. Uh, that are available for application workloads. Uh, and with increased complexity and increased software uh, deployment, uh, the amount of availability on, on the lock mode is, is insufficient today. So what you're basically looking at is uh, uh, a combination of these two, which is called a hybrid mode for ACLB, wherein we, we do not do an, uh, a strategy is to do a redundant uh, a redundancy is carried out only on selective segments of the CPU, which would fulfill the necessary criteria for an ACL beta application uh, from a hardware perspective, and then run uh, a software-based uh, checking strategy on the hardware on a continuous basis, which could, have, which could actually give a higher amount of availability on the systems. And, and this is one of the key strategies uh, that is uh, we, are, we are advocating basically to run it as uh, cockpit and other segments on the on the application processing and uh, and this brings from a so there are key criteria that we saw initially of uh, of uh, segments wherein for every ACL level we need to hit some specific hardware metrics and targets so for for an ACL beta application you would hit, need to hit 90 percent coverage and for a delta, it's 99%. Since the majority of the applications are on beta, so you would, uh, I think the hybrid would, would suit that uh, criteria. Uh, so how would your workload look like at the end? So you'll have a combination of hybrid clusters and, and lock clusters running ADAS, zonal, and actuator, uh, and, and for, seg for applications which need uh, a lock more for running ACL delta applications, then you would have a, a segment to run uh, those specific segments. If they are quality managed, for example, a Linux-based system is being executed on some of the same, then they are, uh, then they are quality managed, then you can run the traditional split mode configuration on the left to execute some of these systems. From, from verification and validation perspective, again here, uh, uh, the key strategy is uh, we have uh, the safety uh, requires the, the, the strategy to deploy across the, uh, across the link and, and the value chain of the product. So right from the IP development, the physical IP deployment, uh, there are specific uh, 
verification and validation strategies for for functional safety that needs to be put in then uh, then it's the architecture of the SOC uh, then then uh, beyond also on the software layers the soft the safety needs to be deployed across these segments to ensure uh, there's no weak link in the entire uh, structure of deployment of a hardware to run safety and, and secure workloads. Uh, I think uh, at the end, uh, from, from an ARM perspective, uh, uh, commitment is to expand those CPUs which deploy functional safety. The, the IP as well, the physical IP which gets deployed along with it are, are also safety certified. Uh, the key uh, from, a, from a technological leadership perspective deploying new functional safety features like hybrid lock to ensure that uh, they are developed to meet the automotive seg segments criteria, needs and demands from their application workload perspective and, uh, and, and, and certifying all our products basically by an, and by an independent thing so that there's a shift left strategy gets deployed in the automotive segment and, and, and a faster time to market. And, uh, and, and the entire ecosystem as well being certified associated with it. Uh, finally, uh, uh, what we see is a, a software defined vehicle on ARM on which has uh, safety capable to be deployed. Uh, and, and that could uh, be that so that we could make, we could push the industry to meet uh, uh, the criteria for uh, their vision. And, and, uh, and, and that's how we enable that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Do you think that the functional safety standard is keeping up with the ethics requirement of ADAS? Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the, there are various, uh, I mean, uh, this probably with respect to, uh, yeah, from an ADAS and AD perspective, there are new standards that are on play today. So, uh, when it, I, I don't, uh, there, there are certain aspects related to, uh, uh, to uh, those aspects being covered with respect to newer standards, like uh, uh, there's UL 4600 SOTEF uh, being deployed, and there is a new standard for AI ML for functional safety, which is uh, being developed and deployed, which is ISO 8800. And, and these are uh, currently all uh, being uh, investigated within the industry of how, uh, to what extent they need to do. But uh, I, uh, I get the point from where you come from, but but the key point is uh, uh, it the, from a, from a vehicle functionality perspective, it should be no different to that of of a human driver. So if a, if a human driver makes certain logical decisions, it should be a, a similar rational decisions that the vehicle executes in in terms of its ambiguity, and always have a a, a more conservative approach within the within the system to always have a fail safe and a fail operational mechanisms put in, in put into the vehicle so that uh, some of those criteria uh, don't play out so we don't have to make a decision of of uh, ethical and, and decisions there but make it into more fail safe until now until the level 3 system uh, we we saw five levels of level 5 uh, i mean level 1 to level 5 on on adas and ad up to level 3 the the, the responsibility is with the driver. So the fallback is the driver itself. So the vehicle has to give control back to the, uh, to the driver to basically drive uh, on, on a level three systems and so on. But when it comes to level four and, and five, yeah, so then wherein you don't have a, uh, a steering associated with it or, or maybe it's completely ice off mode, then, uh, then there are uh, segments where it has to uh, be considered and uh, uh, I think there are uh, there are specific use cases and, and discussions within the industry to address that. I would say. So, who takes the responsibility of something going wrong? Somebody gets killed, for example, by an autonomous car. Is that your responsibility as a silicon supplier of the whole tool chain? I, I think it's. Uh, I, th I think the the cause could be uh, various things, but it's it's not actually boiling on down to that segment. So, 
uh, it, it, it has an entire value chain of people who are working on it. It's not going to be a, a particular company or industry. So we need to see how that overall uh, uh, liability thing plays out. But uh, uh, I think it, the industry is still in nascent phases of addressing that topic. Thank you. I, I'm going to take one of the questions online now. Um, from an ARM perspective, how much increase is there typically when you're doing a, from a verification perspective, when you're doing a, a, a automotive ACLD versus ACLB versus just a normal application process? For example? Yeah. So the from a, good question. So from a from a safety perspective, there are some specific criteria that the ISO basically talks about uh, between an ACLB and 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 D. So there are uh, there are specific criteria within the standard which tells you need to perform system integration testing to a certain extent, the hardware integration testing, uh, the silicon block integration testing needs to happen. So there are specific uh, criteria, but the uh, bigger underlying theme is also to make sure that uh, there's good amount of traceability built into the products that we develop. Are we developing the products with the right requirements? Uh, are the other requirements being rightly articulated, addressed, uh, and, and those being deployed within the product? And, and the verification validation strategy should should have that criteria in mind to ensure that there is a uh, or the there is a the sufficient coverage uh, and 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 basically uh, when it comes to software uh, deployment and so on and if I have to look at IP development as as, as an equivalent context uh, it's on a software the MCDC and other strategies is pretty much like uh, hundred percent coverage and so on so there is. Uh, there's absolutely no room for error unless there is a, a, a key exceptions that are present there. But uh, uh, but from a CPU perspective and so on, there are the number of permutation combinations in which those configurations could be created are so enormous that uh, uh, it could be deployed uh, uh, to a larger extent. But the key part is that if we could uh, reduce the number of uh, key configurations where it would be used for an automotive use case, then it gives a finite set of requirements for the verification and validation strategy to be more precise, more robust, and uh, more uh, uh, to be more confident on that. Thank you. I think it's probably a good place to. I think it's a good place to leave it. So, thank you very much for having me.